I want to ask you a question. In a weaker moment, has there been times when you've actually felt small, marginalised, sometimes even asking, well, what's the point? Why? How does this all work together? Because we all have hopes and aspirations. We are on a journey. We're called to Christ. And we want to know how much our participation actually really matters. Now, if I have a, um, if I have a problem, some sort of problem with a local shire. Let's say I have a problem with a local shire. And I go to the shire. I can resolve my problem. But then I, if the problem doesn't get resolved, I can go to the Perth Ombudsman. And the Ombudsman doesn't help me. I can go to the High Court. And the High Court doesn't help me. I can go to the Supreme Court. And if the Supreme Court doesn't help me, I'll write a letter to the Prime Minister. And if the Prime Minister doesn't help me, I'll go to the King of England. Now, brothers and sisters, when we pray, we don't have to go to the Ombudsman or the High Court. We go directly to our Heavenly Father. And that validates us. And this is the SBS, the specific purpose statement of our sermon, that you can, in your life, go to the highest level, God the Father. We come to the Father through Jesus, but you can go, our Father in heaven. You're not talking to a lesser person. Some traditions, religious tradition, you have to go through the church or through the priest. And the priest absolves your sins on your behalf. No, you can go before the God's the Father. That the God who calls you, the God who loves you, the God who looks at you. You realise that God looks at you. Jesus says he numbers the very hairs on our head and that he has made for you extraordinary and wonderful promises. So the first one that I want to share, this is the list that the, the children learn today. God the Father calls us, Jesus Christ equips us, the Holy Spirit convicts us, the written word instructs us, church assembly, the life in the, in the community nurtures us, readers give voice to the word, we have scripture reading, we read the word, and there's a blessing on those who hear take to heart and keep what is written. I'm going to break them all down because it's nice to have a, a banner of key statements. And the first one I want to look at is God the Father calls us. Jesus says in John 6, 44, I have the scriptures on the screen, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. And he makes a promise, I'll raise him up at the last day. In verse 37, all that the Father gives me will come to me and whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. So those, because Jesus is Lord of our lives, the Father has brought us to Jesus. And this is when, verse 65, Jesus says, that's why I told you that no one can come to me unless it's granted by the Father. So your calling to faith is at the highest, highest level. And then Jesus says of the Father, the Father's greater than I am. And yet, you and I, right in Genesis, that's why the Sabbath is so important, because it reminds us of creation, that you and I are created in the image and the likeness of God. And you know all of the Bible is the salvation story of that? Let us create man in our image and likeness. And you and I, as created in God's image and likeness, have access to the highest link in the chain, God the Father. Not a lesser link, the highest link. And the... The redemptive process starts with the Father, brings us to the Father, and ends in the Father. As Paul says, one day we'll be all in God, all in all. <coughs> Isaiah 66, 2 says, if you're ever feeling insignificant or small, the Lord says, this is the one to whom I look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. You're not boastful, you're not proud, he say, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Father, forgive me. I'm a sinner. And you come before the Father. Many times to echo our prayer, our Father in heaven, holy be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it's done in heaven. You know, the Apostle Paul understood this kind of relationship with the Father, this calling. He says in Galatians 1, 5, 15, But when he who had set me apart from when I was born right from when I was separated from my mother's womb, and who called me by his grace. That song that was sung a few minutes ago by Sister Leah and Sister Rebecca, by his grace, was pleased 
to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach him to the Gentiles. So Paul realised by God's grace he was called. The sanctifying grace of God. Sanctification is setting apart for a holy life. You know, Jesus said of this, there are many who are called, but few are chosen. You and I are invited to, to, to hear the word, to participate, to pray, to praise, to reflect Christ in all his glory in us. You know, this many are called, a few are chosen. Do you remember the parable of the sower? Some seed fell on stony ground, some feed... The weeds choked the word, the cares of the world. Some seeds fell on the ground and the birds picked it. Many are called, but few are chosen. The distractions of this way of life in a broken, sinful world. And then the next one I want to look at is Jesus equips us. The next one down, because Jesus said, the Father is greater than I. I and the Father are one. Jesus says, follow me and I will make you. For the disciples those days, I will make you fishers of men. This idea of being equipped, Jesus says, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. There's a certain initiative that Jesus does on behalf of the Father. He says in John 4, 18, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And when we see Revelation chapter 2 and 3, Jesus came to John and says, write down this letter to the seven churches. Things that are, things that are, are things that are yet to come. And the seven churches give unique descriptions of the complete church, wherever they are, gives words of encouragement, gives words of affirmation, and then the call to repent. The correction as Jesus moulds and shapes us, and then he gives us in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 to all the churches, various promises for those who are victorious, those who overcome, and so, not only does Jesus equip us, but he also advocates for us as a high priest intercedes for us. He, he prepares us to come into the presence of the Father, and he also prepares a place for us. That's for the role of Jesus. And at the centre of our salvation narrative is the Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot come to the Father except through Jesus. The priest, the high priest, could only intercede for the ancient Israelites on the Day of Atonement by sprinkling blood on the mercy seat. And so, so Jesus' blood, once he's atoned for the human sin, the veil in the temple was torn and you and I could see physically, if we wanted to, that day, right into the Holy of Holies. We have access to the Father through Jesus Christ. Okay, point number three. Like Rebecca said to the children, do you remember what point number three was? The Holy Spirit convicts us. The Holy Spirit convicts us. And we see the work of the Holy Spirit in the lives of faithful people in the Old Testament. We see it in Jesus' teaching as he explains so much more about the Holy Spirit, the nature, the gifting, the equipping of the Holy Spirit. And we see on the day of Pentecost where the Holy Spirit, because Jesus had paid for sin in a very visible and public way, now the Holy Spirit could come and it came on men and women alike and... Jesus' suffering was to fulfil all righteousness so the Holy Spirit could be poured out. And so Jesus says in John chapter 14, I will ask the Father and he will give you another helper. He's preparing his disciples for his departure. To be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth. For he dwells with you and will be in you. At the moment, those disciples had the Holy Spirit working with them. On the daily day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit entered them. So you and I come to faith Prior to, baptizing because of Holy, prior to baptism, because the Holy Spirit opens our mind, illuminates, teaches us, guides us. John 16, verse 7, Jesus says, It is to your advantage that I go away, for if I do not go away, the helper, the Greek word for that is parakletos, the helper will not come to you, but if I go, I will send him to you. And when he comes, he will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. When the Holy Spirit is in us and working with us, as Sister Rebecca said this morning, our sense of conscience is so much more heightened, really heightened to live a pure, holy life in word and deed and thought. And this conviction of the Holy Spirit for all those. And then Jesus says, I have many things to say to you, but you can't bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, in John 16, now verse 13, he will guide you into all the truth. 
For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. So when Jesus speaks in the book of Revelation, then we hear, he that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The synonymous nature of the Holy Spirit conveying the very words of Jesus, all that the Father is mine, therefore I said, he will take what is mine and declare it to you. And so you see the radical transformation of faithful people on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit was poured out on men and women, able to prophesy, saying, thus says the Lord. And that Holy Spirit now seals us for the day of redemption. As, as, as John chapter 1 says, that we are born of God, not by the will of man or by flesh, but by God, as children of God. And we read various places in the Scripture where Apostle Paul was compelled by the Holy Spirit. We are sanctified by the Holy Spirit, set aside for a holy life. We are regenerated and renewed by the Holy Spirit. In fact, Jesus says it's the Spirit that gives life. We are compelled or constrained by the Spirit in various places. And it's a very beautiful thing that the Holy Spirit leads us into all truth. The personification of this truth is Jesus. And the conviction and the counsel of the Holy Spirit brings us to align ourselves with the Lord Jesus Christ so that we are pure and white to come before our Father. The fourth one is the written word instructs us. There's two things about Sabbath worship that I really like. Scripture reading and prayer. They really mean a lot to me. They always have done, even since a boy. The written word instructs us. Psalm 119 says... Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. A beautiful psalm. Paul wrote to those in, to Timothy, 2 Timothy 3.16. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God and it, what's it for? It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. Why? That the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good word every good work. In Revelation, blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of the, and the words of this prophecy, right at the beginning of Revelation, verse 1, verse 3, and blessed are those who hear it and those who keep what is written in it. There's a process here of the written word instructing us. And my encouragement is that we read the word every day and in every way. You know, um, you remember on the Mount of the Transfiguration, Jesus quoted from Deuteronomy, it is written... Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. It is written. You know, James says in chapter 1, verse 22, Be doers of the word and not hearers only. A sermon like this would be poor if we didn't have the written word. So the bulk of the, today's message is actually us reading scripture and trying to put it in some sort of context. Verse 23 of James 1, For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer. He's like a man who looks intently at his natural face in a mirror and he looks at himself and goes away and forgets what he was like. But the one who looks into the perfect law, the law of liberty and perseveres, so you've got to stay with scripture. You really do. Being no hearer who forgets but a doer who acts, he will be blessed in his doing. And when we read the scriptures, all of salvation narrative, the people who's who lost their lives because of faith, those who stood out as heroes in Scripture, 1 Corinthians 10, 11 tells us, now these things happened to them as an example and they were written down for our instruction. The, the good points of King David and the sordid sin that he participated in. The, the, all the people that, the narrative, read Hebrews chapter 11, that chapter of, of faith. You read the story of Samson. He's waiting the resurrection to the righteous. But he's got a horrible story, a narrative of they were written for our instruction so that we don't make the same mistakes. Sometimes we can learn by hard road of experience. But the word of God is a light to our feet and a lamp to our path that we don't have to make those mistakes. Number five, the church nurtures us. Jesus said, I will build the church. And the essential nature of faithful people coming together, assembling together. 
You know, when we read, when we want to understand what church life looks like, we go to the book of Acts. Jesus had ascended to heaven, the Holy Spirit had come, and people in Jerusalem and the other churches had a very beautiful picture of what it looked like because it was the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Acts chapter 2, verse 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. They devoted themselves to it. Verse 46 of chapter 2, and day by day attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with gladness and generous heart. So one of the things that we try to do as often as we can is get together and share food. As a family, praising God, having favour with all the people, and the Lord added to their number those who are being saved. And so within the church context of church, you have this level of fellowship and this nurture. Your own family for your children should be the most beautiful place of nurture. Like a mother hen with baby chicks under her, caring and protecting and nurturing and feeding Jesus says to the ancient Israelites, he said, I, I wanted to be like a mother hen, broody hen over your chicks, but you wouldn't. There's also love. There's also sacrifice. There's care. When one rejoices, we all rejoice. When one struggles and someone dies, we share their grief. There's overcoming. Iron sharpens iron. We grow together. Um, Hebrews 10 verse 23 says, Hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. How do you hold fast? Let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works. This is community. You can't stir up one another unless you're engaged together as community, not neglecting to meet together. You can be a solo Christian for Jesus, watching your YouTube videos from home when the local church is right beside you. Don't neglect to meet together. By the way, last Sunday we had a lovely men's breakfast. Godly men coming together, sharing in fellowship, and we could have talked for hours. We didn't. We had to go away to our families. But encouraging one another, all the more as you see the day drawing nearer. Apostle Paul felt that Jesus would return in his lifetime. Wow, we are closer to that time than ever before. And, you know, when Jesus closed off the old covenant and initiated a new covenant, how did he do it? He did it in community, and he did it over the symbolic tokens of a meal, bread and drink. Very intimate, very personal, that's a microcosm of the kingdom. And when we study the seven churches in the book of Revelation, you won't find, of those seven churches in Revelation 2 and 3, the perfect church. All have some growing pains to go through. Um, what we do, we grow together, we pray together, we repent together, we benefit and bless one another, and together we become part of a success story. The kingdom of God is the family of God, and the church is the microcosm of the kingdom. Have you ever thought of that? How precious it is when faithful comes, people come together? The next one is readers, those who read the scripture. How important that is in the chain. In other words, you read scripture and you give voice to it. As Paul said to Timothy, devote yourself to the public reading of Scripture. Now there were some people in northern where we live, they belong to a, another denomination, who stand outside the post office with their old tattered Bible and just read Scripture. And I walked past them and I thought, oh, how quaintly odd. But they were following this, the public reading of Scripture. For us, public reading of Scripture, he's opening the Bible and saying, oh, would so-and-so read Scripture today? And not just one or two verses, a section that speaks to us. Last night at a dinner table I read Scripture and my wife said, why did you choose that Scripture? Why? I had to give a reason because there was a reason why I chose it. And brothers and sisters, we live in a literate society. In the first century, you went to the local synagogue or the local church to hear the Scriptures read to you because only the scribes and the Pharisees and educated people learn to read and write. But today, every little child learns to read. I noticed some other children here. They can read. When Titus was right, I got some mail from Titus this week, and he had written a love letter to me. So children can read and write at the earliest of age. But, um, you know, today, we're encouraged to read and to quote and to utilise scripture for exhortation and teaching in our natural narrative. Um, if I turn to, um, turn to the first century, 
Acts 13, beginning in verse 14, And on the Sabbath day they went into the synagogue and sat down, and after reading from the law and the prophets. So that takes us from Genesis all the way to Malachi. There's a lot of richness in the scriptures there, etc. Let me go down to the next scripture, verse 44. The next Sabbath, almost the whole city gathered to hear the word of the Lord. Somebody had to read it. And somebody had to read it with feeling, with passion, with eth pathos. Brothers and sisters, we base our whole testimony on Scripture. You know, when a new king would come and lead ancient Israel, this is what the instructions were. I just want to read it briefly. And when the king sits on his throne in his kingdom, Deuteronomy 17 verse 18, he shall write for himself in a book a copy of the law. He was to write out the first five books of the Bible, approved by the Levitical priests, and it shall be with him, and he shall read it all the days of his life. So leaders, and we're all leaders in our spheres of influence, that he may learn to fear the Lord his God by keeping all the words of this law, these statutes, and doing them, that his heart is not lifted up before his brothers, that he may turn us, not turn aside from the commandment, either the right hand or the left. He may continue long in the kingdom, he and his children. What about Joshua? When he took over from Moses, man, he stepped in some big shoes. Joshua 1.8, The book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, and you shall meditate it day and night, and you may be careful to do according to what's written in it. I like leaders who read the Bible. Very powerful. What about in the New Testament? The Bereans examined the scriptures with eagerness and they did it daily to see that those things were so. They were no more noble than those in Thessalonica. They examined the scriptures to prove that Christ was the Messiah. And in Revelation we read, blessed are those who read the word of God, blessed are those who hear it, blessed are those who take it to heart. That takes us to the seventh point, hearers. Very powerful because there are two aspects of it. There are those who read scripture and there are those who hear it. There are two aspects in the the congregational life. You're familiar with the scriptures, but you hear every week somebody else read it out. But then there is another group of hearers who hears it for the first time. And the conviction of the Holy Spirit means they make a little change in their life. They begin to take it to heart and then they begin to keep it. And they themselves then become readers of that scripture. You know, let's have a look at Romans 10. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then can they call on him on whom they've not believed? How does that message arrive to them? And how do they, how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? Who is Jesus, said the eunuch to Philip that time. And how are they to hear without someone preaching? And how are they to preach unless someone's sent? Brothers and sisters, the call to ministry is strategically important to the body of Christ and to the whole kingdom equation. Our participation is powerful as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach good news. They use the Bible and the Bible alone. And then finally in verse 17, so faith comes from hearing and hearing the word of Christ. Brothers and sisters, We are called to read and we're called to hear. And our testimony is very powerful. I don't have a testimony except the word of God, written word of God, taken to heart. And we are called to, to allow the biblical text to be the living, divinely inspired, authoritative word of God in all matters of practice and faith. Let's go to Deuteronomy. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and with all your mind. And these words that I commend you today shall be on your heart. Not just a book sitting on a shelf, but the word of God in your heart. You know, what begins in the heart reigns in the home. And what reigns in the home manifests as a public testimony to Jesus. You shall teach them diligently to your children. Thank you, Sister Rebecca, and all those who are helping. 
You shall talk of them when you sit in your house. What do you talk about? The Word of God. And when you walk by the way and when you lie down and when you rise, you shall bind them as a sign on your hand. So what you do is in accordance to Scripture. They shall be as frontlets between your eyes. Like, that's who you are. You shall write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. One of our children gave me a beautiful wooden carving, Christ is the head of his house. And I put it like on a doorpost on, the, on our house, right up on the roof of the lintel, as a symbolic gesture that, you know, you have nothing else as you come before your heavenly Father but the word of God to reflect his authority, his kingdom, you know. And so how does God look at you? This is the one to whom I look and to whom I'll look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Otherwise we will feel insignificant and just doing religion and going through routine. So when we pray, at whatever station of life we're at, wherever we've come, we can go directly through those seven steps, living a faithful life to a Heavenly Father. And we only do that through the, authority, the redemptive blood of Jesus, as I mentioned earlier. You know, Jesus has a testimony. He is the Word of God personified. He says that the Father numbers the hairs on our head. He feeds the little birds and he knows every little bird that falls. I've been manif meditating on what that means in scientific terms. And as the Lord says, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts. For as the heavens are higher than worth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. And I try to think, what, how can I begin to comprehend the greatness of God? But I can, in the microcosm of the kingdom of God, realise the sovereign hierarchy of the Father, His timing, our Father's purpose, and the seven-linked chain can help me understand and visualise that in whom I have direct access. So I just want to remind you now, the Father calls us. Jesus Christ equips us. The Holy Spirit counsels us and convicts us. The written word instructs us. Church assembly nurtures us. Readers give voice to the word. We have a prevailing sense of stewardship. And hearers, the fruit of reading scripture, hear, take to heart and keep the word. And Jesus in building the church says, he that has an ear. Let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. When you look at your status in life and you come before the Heavenly Father and you think, what would the Lord say to me? He knows the hairs on my head. Surely he has a word for me. Isaiah 43, 1 is our last scripture for the day. The Lord says, fear not. It's awesome. You can barely comprehend it. Don't be afraid. I have redeemed you. Says Jesus, I gave my life, my blood for you. I have called you by name. You're not just a number in a computer system. I know you by name. Names are precious. You are mine. Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. God looks to us of humble and contrite spirit as we try to in prayer and in presence and in participation, come before the throne of grace in our small stature that have the privilege by the blood of Jesus, by the counsel and the clarity of the Spirit, in the nurture of the church by the written word spoken and listened to, to come before our Heavenly Father and be justified in Jesus as the children of God. There's no greater privilege, there's no greater understanding in the salvation narrative to which we've been invited.